Okay, everybody. Again, welcome to uh, today's lunchtime virtual rapid fire event. Uh, welcome, especially to the, the New England LRIG members. Uh, and also a special welcome to those members outside in Elrig, North America. We're of course extending this outside of uh, our usual region. And also I know there are a number of guests outside of the region and even outside of the USA. Uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, we have four excellent topics to cover in the next hour. So uh, I'll get right down to it. Um, at the beginning of each topic, I'm gonna introduce each presenter uh, and the topic, and from there, we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes for their presentation and a short question and answer. Uh, please post your questions in the uh, Q&A box, and we'll answer as many as we can, as time permits, after the presentation. As well, if we have time at the end, we'll uh, go back to some of the questions and questions that pop up. Um, we've had a couple of technical difficulties with one of these, and so we're shifting the, uh, the agenda around a little bit. Uh, Dr. Mott's course card will probably be uh, presenting at the very end. Uh, during each introduction, I'm going to run a short poll for feedback to Elrig. Uh, these will end as each presentation begins, and so uh, please fill them out promptly if you're interested in filling them out. Uh, and also during the Q&A periods, we'll have contact info for each presenter posted. You can leave your contact info as well in the chat window, and we'll hook up you with the relevant presenters that you're interested in. Uh, so anyways, without further ado, uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Steve McCoy, the head of sales in Lab Voice. Uh, they're, they're developing voice recognition software to help simplify and streamline lab automation tasks. In his introduction to virtual and voice assistants to automate workflows, we'll hear about the state of the art in voice control, uh, and its application in the lab. So Steve, let me hand the controls over to you. Thanks, Sam. Let me, uh, let's see here. And okay. Excellent. So hi, everybody. Uh, I am Steve McCoy, head of sales at Loud Voice. Unfortunately, I'm not a doctor. I really appreciate that, Sam, but uh, I do Excuse not me. have my PhD. <laughs> uh, anyways, um, before beginning, I'd like to quickly thank uh, the organizers of this event, Sam, Dan, Rita, members of the Elrig New England chapter for inviting us to speak here today. Um, and so with that, let's begin. So at Lab Voice, we know that scientists want to be safe, efficient, and most of all, focus on their science. So Lab Voice provides a hands-free laboratory experience by bringing the first voice assistant tailored specifically for you and your workflows. No need to look away or take off your gloves while working in the lab and performing tasks like taking notes, working with software, or using instrumentation. We're working to voice enable your lab of the future today. So before getting into how Lab Voice actually works, I'd just like to take a moment to explain our thinking and philosophy when it comes to the role of virtual and voice assistants in the lab and how it drives digital transformation. So essentially, we view a platform like Lab Voice as a gap filler, relying on our team's expertise and knowledge of lab systems and workflows, we have taken an integration first approach to the Lab Voice deployment. So a user can speak to Lab Voice and have that information relayed to the cloud. And if the request or action is simple enough, like setting a timer or starting a setting a reminder, they can have that sent back to them. But we also can integrate with the existing infrastructure in the lab using voice to control instruments, collect instrument readouts, update your ELN, LIMS, asset management and inventory platforms, and many, many other use cases, which we'll touch upon later on in the presentation. So we work hand in hand with our customers to figure out where Lab Voice will augment the existing processes, infrastructure, and investments you've made into your lab and scientists over the past several years. So let's take a little bit, uh, or let's take a short look at how Lab Voice actually works. So there's two ways that we get Lab Voice into the lab environment. We have developed a smart speaker that you can put on your bench or workspace. And this is really designed for activities in fixed locations. If I'm working at a hood 
or at a glove box, if I'm sitting down at a bench looking through a microscope or pipetting for several hours or weighing, as we'll see in a demo video, uh, this is how we've thought about deploying LabVoice smart device. And its size is similar to that to an Echo Dot or a Google Home that you, I'm sure you've seen in homes and locations around you. It's really easy to set up. It comes with a power adapter that can be plugged in, connects to Wi-Fi, there's an Ethernet port, there's even USB ports on it for simple integrations as well. But that's not ideal for people who are on the move, and that's why we developed the Lab Voice mobile app. So this is available both through iOS and Android stores, and it comes with a few additional capabilities that the smart device doesn't have. So first of all, we can take advantage of the camera, and now I can record video or take a picture or scan a barcode. But also, I have a visual interface. So now, if I'm walking through an SOP or a method, I can see step-by-step -step instructions right in front of me. Also, I can see exactly what LabVoice is recording. And if there is an error, I can ask LabVoice to redo to then recollect that answer. And it's much more likely that a user is going to catch errors through a secondary source rather than through their own handwriting or own keyboarding. So out of the box, users are able to access the features that everyday voice assistants like Siri can offer. We can set timers and reminders, take down notes and observations, perform calculations and conversions. However, the true value of the Lab Voice platform begins to unlock when the voice-enabled workflows that we introduce can be tailored to each lab. So we have a workflow designer that allows us to take any sort of process, an SOP, method, protocol, even a checklist, and turn that into a lab flow or what we call one of these voice-assisted workflows. So now we can have a more complex back and forth dialogue between lab voice and the user to ensure that the selected process is completed safely with a higher degree of data integrity and compliance and oftentimes at a more productive pace. So here's an example of this process in action. We have a video of a sample weighing process filmed in a lab, and this is our demo for you today. Some things to note before we start the video. One, our customer using lab voice for this workflow is often weighing out dozens of samples at a time at a minimum. However, we don't need to sit here and watch a 10 minute demo video to drive home the point of how we use voice to create a, a uh, voice enabled workflow. Secondly, the video is filmed in a noisy lab and the user has a German accent. So this video will demonstrate how our technology can filter out the background noise and how it handles the accent. Third, there are integrations with both the balance and the barcode scanner. So all the user has to do is move the sample around. And we'll start this now. Welcome to Lab Boys. Hey, Lab Boys. Use weighing. Sure, Tony. Has balance one been checked today? Yes. Great. What's the sample set ID? 9694. How many samples in sample set 9694? Two samples. What kind of solvent will you use? Water. What's the solvent ratio? Five. Okay, two samples. Prepare the empty tubes and samples for weighing. Hey, lab voice. Continue. Scan the barcode and place the empty tube on the scale. Transfer the client sample mass to the tube on the balance and say way. Way. Scan the barcode and place the empty tube on the scale. Transfer the client sample mass to the tube on the balance and say way. Way. 
All two samples have been recorded for sample set 9694. The report has been sent to you. So other than calling up that user for not wearing gloves, I would like to point out one aspect of the video that just may not be apparent to non-lab voice users. So that video went as smoothly as possibly as it could have gone, and that's with good reason. We actually designed it that way. So if you're familiar with the concept of a happy path, we have the ability to account for any deviation as a user moves throughout a process or a protocol. So for example, lab voice at the beginning of the video asked, has the balance been checked today? If the user had replied no or I don't know instead of yes, we could have two completely different set of instructions to instruct the user on how to proceed. So here's a example of a case study that we've reviewed uh, that we've done with one of our customers, Metabolon. This was done with a CRO, about 300 piece people based out of North Carolina. And this is essentially their research operations team would have to sort out incoming samples daily requiring two people to do this process. So one person would sit with samples, read the sample ID and wait for the other to find the appropriate destination for that sample or sample rack on a piece of paper. The person handling the samples would then place the sample where it needs to go. And it worked, but using two people to accomplish a job that ideally would only require one person was not necessarily adequate, especially at a cost conscious CRO and especially during COVID times. So we replaced the person reading the piece of paper with lab voice. Now this person picks up the sample or the sample rack, they read the ID out loud and lab voice instructs them on where to place it. Not only does this free up somebody else to focus on other tasks, but it actually makes the process faster. So our champion there likes to joke it's because they're no longer talking about what they're doing during the upcoming weekend, but essentially what took two people to do an hour, now one person is doing in half an hour. And so I'd be happy to do a deep dive into other use cases, and there's at least one other on our website that you should check out if you're interested. But for the sake of time, we'll just sort of quickly touch on them here. And this slide does a really good job of demonstrating there's a number of different labs, a number of different integrations, and a number of different customer types that we're supporting. But this is not just to say that because you can voice enable a workflow means that you should. In fact, we vet that process with our customers as we move throughout the deployment process. So we're constantly ensuring that they're receiving the value that they would expect from the presence of a virtual assistant. And speaking of that value, we've seen lab voice that through Lab Voice, users have been able to experience a wide variety of positive outcomes. So for the company, we're enabling more data to be generated in the lab, increasing the quality of the data and making it machine readable for further analysis down the road. For scientists, we can promise to make their lives a bit easier, automating quote unquote boring tasks and transforming their workplace into a safer, more efficient environment. So I'll pause in just a minute to wrap up and answer any questions. And if we don't have time for yours, feel free to reach out to us by the info email address. You can visit the website. We have a chat bot there. You can also email me directly. If we always appreciate follows on LinkedIn. Um, and if you're interested in receiving a custom prototype of Lab Voice, if there's a process or a workflow that you have in mind that you would like to see voice enabled, we can, uh, we can certainly build those for you rather quickly. So don't hesitate to reach out. And with that, I will conclude now and open the floor to any questions. Thanks, Steve. Um, I have one question here on the Q&A column. Can, uh, can Lab Voice be integrated into existing ELNs? Yes, so we have taken the integration first approach in terms of building Lab Voice. And you know, internally, we like to joke that it is an integration platform with voice built on top of it. So if you go to the partner section of our website, you'll see that we have some uh, ELNs already listed there. Sino is one of those. And we're actively going out and partnering with more software vendors. We should have an another announcement sometime over the next week or so with another uh, large ELN provider. But we're happy to do that both on a custom basis as well as off-the-shelf plat platforms and tools like .matic, Sino, IDBS, 
credentialing and so on. Great. Let me, we have another question pop up and let's try to squeeze this into a, the little tiny bit of space we have here. Um, how do you interface the phone with the instrument? So to answer that as quickly as I possibly can, the integration is actually happening through cloud services or other types of IoT devices that we place behind your firewalls and in your infrastructure. The phone itself is then communicating to those devices through the cloud. Uh, we'd be happy to go through any sort of tech review or architecture review um, with folks, again, in a little bit more detail. That's a really simple answer to that question. Well, great. I appreciate the presentation. It was, uh, it was very interesting. Um, let me just uh, move in there and let me introduce- Yes, and again, our, thank you for having us, Sam. Oh, you're very welcome. Um, let me introduce our next topic, which is re-envisioning uh, track-based microplate automation is presented by Hudson Robotics. Uh, unfortunately, Bruce Jameson wasn't able to make it today, so Stephen Vol is presenting in his place. Uh, as well as being professionally involved in lab automation for the last two decades, he's been a full-time high school chemistry teacher for much of that time. So my hat's off for <clears throat> giving back to the community like that. Um, the topic he's presenting is re-envisioning track-based microplate automation. Steve? Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks for letting me step into Bruce's shoes here at the last minute. Uh, <laughs> I'm a product manager slash marketing slash uh, Mid-Atlantic uh, account manager for Hudson Robotics. Uh, Hudson Robotics to give you a little bit of back. Okay, re-envisioning track-based microplate automation. So usually when you think about a track-based stack type system for automation, you think of them as being very fixed and inflexible and very prone to malfunctions and jams. Uh, you usually configure them to do simple tasks, maybe serving a single instrument, and they're very specific to the vendor that you're serving the instrument for. Uh, so you would expect that if you had a Hudson stacker, it would be in front of a Hudson instrument. Uh, Hudson's taken that paradigm and, and really thrown it to the wayside. So. Uh, the Hudson Labs Link system is very flexible and adaptable. Uh, it can work on Hudson devices or third-party devices. Uh, it can be reconfigured in the field very easily because of its modular design. And because of this, lab links can be applied to either a simple task where you're serving a single instrument, or it can be easy, even be implemented into serving larger complex workflows. So a little note about this stacker that we have over here. So this is the stack link, it's just the heart of the lab link system. And it's not just a gravity fed stacker. Inside of the stacker base here, there's a gripper that does uses positive gripper control to guide the plates out of the stack down to the track that runs through the bottom of the stack. Uh, this allows you to run different types of consumable devices into the, in the stacker, including shallow well microplates, deep well microplates, tip boxes with and without lids. And it also allows you to do things like shuffle the deck of the stacker to give you random access to anything that's in the stack. So what you traditionally think of when you think of a microplate stacker and a track system serving an instrument is a single instrument that is serving a single device. Here we're showing our stack link serving our micro 10 non-contact dispenser. And you can cycle through and serve all of the plates in the stack. So you can do a very simple implementation on the desktop where you add the stack link, add the track, and you cycle it into a single device. You can also daisy chain different components of the lab link system together to handle more complex tasks. Here we see a uh, system where you have a stack link feeding plates to a non-contact dispenser, then a plate washer, and then a sealer, and then stacking back up, allowing you to do more complex tasks than you would expect from a simple stack link, a stacker type track based system. What sets lab links apart is the control of the track. 
each stack link can control a different section of the track. So you can have different plates moving in different directions out of the stack link. Here we're showing two devices being served by the stack link, but instead of them both being served on one side of the stack link, there it's actually serving two instruments that could be doing two separate processes on either side of the stack link. Because you have two stacks in the stack link, you can shuffle through and gain access to any single plate or consumable that's in that stack and send it to an instrument on either the right or the left of the instrument. You can daisy chain stack links together to give you accumulator capacity in the middle of a process. Let me start this animation. So we're here we're showing a stack link feeding plates out and by including additional stack links in the process to accumulate or to provide incubation time because we could heat or cool the stack link if we need to, uh, we can give random access of any plate in the stack, either pass through a stack to another instrument or passed serially through the process. This allows us to build as complex a system as we need to by mixing matching the modular components. So we have the stack link, then we have different layer levels and lengths of track link that we can be incorporating. The track links come in a four foot section, a two foot section, a 13 inch section and a six inch section. And wherever there's a device that we want to uh, stop a plate at to have some kind of liquid handling or, or plate washing or sealing or a print and apply perhaps, we would put a stop link on that track that controls where that plate stops in the process. And by incorporating these different components, we can do anything from a simple system that serves one instrument all the way up to a very complex microplate handling system for a, a, a multi-instrument work cell. Once you're done with your process, the system isn't obsolete because all of the components can be taken apart, broken down and reutilized in a different configuration. And the SoftWinks lab automation software controls the entire process regardless of whether or not it's serving a single instrument or multiple instruments. So here we're showing the SoftWinks lab automation software. It can control all of the different uh, scenarios that I showed you above. So it can handle a single instrument. It can handle multiple instruments in a serial configuration, or it could handle separate instruments that are being served independently of each other on either side of a stack link. Uh, the SoftLink lab automation software also controls all of our robotically controlled work cells, and it's a very intuitive GUI type drag and drop software program. Uh, if you've ever done a flow chart, uh, you're more than prepared to write a program in SoftLinks. So because of this toolbox of components for lab links and this modular approach, you can do anything from a simple task all the way up to a complex integration. Here we're showing two stack links going across the deck of a solo liquid handler from Hudson Robotics. So the plate comes out, it goes onto the deck of the liquid handler. The liquid handler can perform the conventional function that you would think that any gantry robot type liquid handler could perform. In this case, it's taking an aspiration out of a deep well plate, doing a mix in a 24 well plate. And I hit the wrong button, I apologize.
So what's interesting to see is that the track, because of the independent track control by each stack link, can move multiple plates in the process. And it can even go backwards and forwards with different portions of the track. So if you wanted to add some plates and go back into the beginning stack, I got to stop waving my mouse around. Uh, you could go backwards and put the plate back in the originating stack if you wanted to, or you could move it forward into the stack that it goes into at the completion of the assay. Here's another system with two components. So we're showing it coming out of the plate handler, goes through a barcode reader, then the plates go into a plate washer. That's the Hudson Rapid Wash plate washer. And once the plate is done plate washing, it's gonna go back down onto the lab links track and go forward into a non to dispenser, the Hudson Micro 10. Finally, once the new reagents are dispensed into the plate, the plate will be cycled into the second stack where it could be accumulated for retrieval and going into another process or storage, or it can be accumulated to go further on into a process that would continue off camera to the left. Lab Links is also compatible with the Hudson lines of play crane robots. So if you had a device that you wanted to handle that was not track compatible, a robot could lift it off of the track, put it on the deck of the device, and then put it on back on the, the, the deck of the uh, track. For instance, if you wanted to say, go into an X peel to unpeel a plate, the track could come up to the plate crane, the plate crane could insert the plate into the X peel, then put it back onto the track once the seal was removed. Uh, regardless of the type of plate handler, whether it's a lab link system or the plate crane robot line, they're all handled by the same soft link software package. So having the lab links toolkit at your disposal, it allows you to uh, perform a lot of segmentation of your process to make sure that you can maximize the throughput of your assay. So a lot of times when you have a larger work cell and you have more than two or three components served by a single robot, that robot might go on a track to serve more instruments that are further over in the work cell. Well, that takes a lot of time, and then the robot ends up being the bottleneck in the process. Lab Links allows you to take a robotic work cell and be able to segment the process so you only have a handful of instruments served by one robot, and then the plate can go downstream on the Lab Link system and accumulate in a stacker as it waits to go into another segment or island of automation in the process. So you see up here, we have a robot that's served by, uh, that's serving several different thermocyclers. When it's done with a plate, in one of the thermocyclers, it puts it on the track and it accumulates in that stacker. And then you could chain these work cell together and have a continuous process where all of this uh, plates can be scheduled so that they can then make it to the end of the track all in serial position as required. This allows you to do a very complex work cell that's very efficient with very little bottleneck or no bottleneck from the plate handling. Steve, I'm afraid I have to break in because we've, we've run out of time for this and I've got to keep this on, uh, on the timing mark. That's okay, this is my last slide. <laughs> um, do you, all right, well, great. Um, we can run into, there's a couple of questions here, but sure. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna move on to, uh, um, to Hans Christian Leuterman and hopefully we can get back to those questions at the end, okay? Sure. Um, so next up is, is Hans Christian Leuterman. He's uh, the founder of Menasense. Uh, his work is focused on solving the problems of, of rapidly and precisely measuring small amounts in a microplate format, a real challenge for, for many medical research and, and clinical labs. His presentation is titled Non-Contact Volume Measurement in Microplates for Process Quality Control. And uh, I'm looking forward to this, Hans. 
Thank you, Sam. Let me let me figure out if I can share my screen. Can you see my screen? I do. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody, and uh, thank you in particular to the to the folks at Elric for for making this happen and for for giving us us an opportunity to to, to present this this work here. So volume measurement in, in microplates for process QC. Uh, why would you want to do that? Here's just a few examples of why people are interested. I'm just using this as an opportunity to set the stage for, for what we're trying to do. Uh, so one is inventory management. You want to know how much compound is left in a certain tube or a certain plate so you can replenish your inventory um, in time and, and, and don't, don't run out. Uh, another big block and, and that kind of encompasses most of these tasks is process verification. And that starts with inputs is there for example just as an example here is there enough of this patient sample to even begin this process is there enough that came off of this dna extraction to begin our process those those kinds of things then a big part is liquid handler quality control does the liquid handler do what we think it does or what we're telling it to do and then the last part is monitoring process outputs um, are we delivering what we say we are and that could be either in, in a commercial setting let's say you're making reagent kits you're delivering plates that have uh, certain contents per well or or you're in a you're in a, a compound management group and you're delivering asset ready plates to your assay ready plates to your uh, internal customers and you just want to convince yourself and them that what you're giving them is is uh, what, what you're actually telling them now what if you could have a technology that allows you to verify liquid volumes in line in near real time with really high resolution in a non-contact way what, you could, what that would allow you to do is you could basically generate an audit trail for every sample as it, as it moves through your process. Now, the Menasense technology is a technology that allows you to do um, volume measurements in line. It works on any liquid. It's completely non-contact and non-destructive, by extension, then also sterile. Um, it is very high resolution. The resolutions we've demonstrated range from about a nanoliter fill height resolution in a 1536 well plate to 10 to 20 nanoliter uh, resolution in a 96 well plate. It works in all plate densities and it works in plates and, and two bracks that are in, in SPS, SPS format. This is just a, a teaser of, of what a result looks like. So what, what you see here is a meniscus of uh, an aliquot of DMSO uh, in a 384 well plate. And then we're just adding a very, a very well-defined uh, small aliquot to it. The, the way we make very well-defined small aliquots is we use precision bearing balls and just drop them into the well. So in this case, these are 33 nanoliter volume. So that corresponds to just adding a very small volume to uh, an assay ready plate, for example, as part of the dilution, and then convincing yourself that you've actually done that. Uh, and if you, if you look at this, you can see that these uh, 33 nanoliter uh, additions are, are very, very well resolved. Now, how does it work? The technology works by measuring the distance to the liquid surface. And we're doing that by comparing optical path lengths. There's two optical paths. One path is the path from our sensor to the liquid surface and back. And the other path is a reference path, the length of which we can measure very, very accurately. From that, we get the distance to the, to the uh, liquid surface. From that, we get the fill height. And from the fill height and the plate geometry, we get the volume of liquid in the container. In a little bit more detail, um, on, on the left-hand side here is sort of a schematic diagram of, of the type of interferometer we use. So you have light from a light source hitting a beam splitter where the wavefront is split and part of the wavefront goes, part of the beam goes down onto the sample and the other part of the beam is transmitted through the beam splitter and travels towards a reference mirror where it is reflected. The sample also reflects light back to the beam splitter and then the beam splitter combines the reference path and the sample path and the combined beam now uh, hits, hits the detector. We can vary the difference, the path length difference between the reference uh, path and the sample path very accurately and keep track of that. If we do that, the signal we see on the detector looks like that signal that's schematically shown on, on the right hand side here. So what, what you see in that signal is, is two features. One is just a very high frequency sinusoidal oscillation and the other one is a much slower amplitude modulation of that signal. So a much more slowly varying envelope of that signal. 
the high frequency signal, that is due to interference between the two beams. And you can think about that as two wave trains, one moving down the sample path and one moving down the reference path. And as they get recombined, if the, if the paths are equal to within an integer multiple of uh, a wavelength of light, what happens is you have the peaks on one wave train and the peaks of the, on the other wave train uh, superimposed. So they um, constructively interfere, they magnify each other. So in the, in the output signal, you have a relative maximum. If they're off by half a wavelength, what happens now is that you have the peaks on one wave train and the troughs on another wave train superimposed and they cancel each other out. So you have relative darkness on the detector and the relative minimum in this high frequency signal. That's interferometry and that's how the main, that's how the high frequency component works here. What's special about the type of interferometry that we use for, for, for this particular application is that we use a light source where you only observe this type of interference for a very narrow range of path length differences. That's called uh, low coherence uh, in interferometry and we do that by using a light source, standard light sources such as for example uh, light emitting diodes or, or superluminescent diodes. And now in, in that case uh, so we monitor the amplitude of that high frequency signal and when the sample path and the reference path are exactly equal, that's when this, uh, this envelope reaches its maximum. And when we have that, when we uh, reach that maximum, we can measure the, the length of the reference path. From that, we get the distance to the liquid surface. And from that, we ultimately get, get the liquid volume. So that's a little bit of more of, a, of, a, of an in-depth explanation of, of, of how this technology works. And uh, anybody who's talked to me about this before will know that I can talk about this ad nauseum. I will, I will not do that now. Um, so just talking about um, what types of uh, resolutions can we, can we achieve. Um, shown here is uh, two examples in 384 and 1536 well plates. What we've done is we've um, just repeatedly measured fill height profiles in these, uh, in these plates of, of, the same, of the same aliquot. And then what's shown here is the solid black line is the mean of, the, of these 10 fill height profiles and the, the gray lines of plus minus one standard deviation. If we crunch all this data and look at it, we, we find that our fill height resolution is on the order of hundreds of nanometers. And that is in this case is basically limited by uh, the encoder we measured to, uh, we, we use to measure the reference path length. In a 384 well plate, that corresponds to about two nanoliters of fill height resolution. And then the 1536 well plate where the cross section of the well is smaller, it corresponds to about a nanoliter of, of fill, height, fill height resolution. So very, very high, very high resolution. We can also obtain very good accuracy and we've done this by comparing uh, gravimetric testing of uh, distilled water aliquots with a uh, volume measurement using, using our technology. And you can see here that this, uh, this graph is very, very linear. And there's two different ways you can, you can look at the, the accuracy of, of your measurement. You can go aliquot by aliquot and um, compare your, uh, the, the, the measured volume using our technology with the, the mass that was obtained. And if we do that, we get inaccuracies that are around a percent. And you can also just use all aliquots at the same time. And the, the slope of that curve should give you the inverse of the density. If we do that, we end up with uh, inaccuracies a little bit better than 2%. So all in all, we achieve inaccuracies of better than 2%, which is very competitive with other uh, technologies available to do uh, fill height measurement, uh, measurement that are uh, not non-destructive and, and non-contact. Uh, and another practical example, these are um, racked tubes. So these are 96 well um, tubes for, for acoustic dispensing that are in a 96 tube rack. And what we've done here is we've taken a sample of uh, six tubes and we filled uh, each tube with several aliquots of, of DMSO. This is, this is typically used in, in compound management. So DMSO is the, is the applicable solvent. And then for each of these aliquots, we've determined the mass of the aliquot using gravimetric testing, and we've measured and we've measured the fill height, and that's all that's all shown in this plot here on the left. Now, what's shown in this table on the right is the results of a thought experiment. So we've taken we're we're holding the data for one tube back from the whole data set and use all other tube use the data for all other tubes to generate a calibration curve to calibrate fill height against fill volume. And then we use the data from the tube that we held back from the calibration curve and plug the, uh, the fill height numbers that we've obtained for these tubes into that calibration curve and obtain volumes. And those volumes we, com we compare to the measured masses for these aliquots. And that's how we get accuracy and precision numbers for, for each of these scenarios here. The reason I'm showing all this is that this is a, a, a true practical 
uh, a true practical um, illustration of the performance that's possible with this, including both the, the very, very high resolution of our uh, fill height measurement and the manufacturing tolerances of this, of this particular type of tube, which of course are, are much, much, uh, sm the manufacturing tolerances are much, much larger than what we can uh, achieve in terms of, in terms of fill, height, fill height measurement. So in a, in a 96 well tube, um, low microliter accuracy and precision, and we've actually found with uh, several other tube systems that that seems to be uh, pretty, pretty representative for, for what is possible with, with, this, with this technology without previously calibrating uh, specific, specific labware. Uh, this is this is the, the the slide I used as a teaser early on. So uh, incremental additions to small incremental additions to um, plates in a 384 well plate, very high very high resolution. And if if you plot the fill height linearly, um, it's it's a very nice very nice linear regression. So so it all it all makes sense and it checks out. One thing um, we've been we've been working on more recently, and it's a little bit of an earlier application for us, is to in a non-contact way, measure the volume of droplets as they are dispensed, for example, by uh, acoustic liquid handlers or other uh, type of droplet droplet dispensers. So the way we do that is we use our interferometer to measure the apex height of the droplet. So basically measure the height of the droplet at its center. You see here in the, in, in, at, across the, uh, the top of this, of, of this slide, you actually see the, the raw data of what that type of interferogram that I showed earlier as a nice schematic looks like. And then you can see how we're extracting the envelope from it. And from that, we get the apex elevation of the droplet. We then also take uh, an image of the droplet looking down onto the droplet and use image processing to determine the contact diameter or contact radius of the droplet on, on the surface. And those two quantities are actually enough to determine knowing, given that we know the equation that governs the shape of, of liquid droplets on the surface, those two, equa those two quantities are enough to uh, determine, the, determine the droplet volume. And we've shown this, we've shown this here for, um, for a number of droplets of, of different sizes. Um, the, the droplet cross sections shown here are actually to scale. The images are not, but there are 100 micrometer scale bars in each of these images. And it's shown on both uh, microscope slides, but also, for example, the, the middle droplet here is shown in a, in a, 15, in a 1536 well plate. So very, very typical applications of what would come off uh, an acoustic liquid handler, for example. So this is uh, an, an example of our of one of our um, early stage early stage instruments. So it's a it's a self-contained plate reader type instrument that has a, a, a built-in PC. A sing, single board computer controls the whole thing. Uh, you can also talk to it um, externally from from a scheduling software. There is a there's a REST API where you can send commands to um, to basically perform perform the various reads, set set plate types, um, and 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 so on. So uh, just, just to summarize, um, we offer volume measurement that is in line, works on pretty much any liquid, is completely non-contact, non-destructive and sterile, uh, is very, very high resolution and works in plates and tube racks in SBS format in the sort of common, common densities. Thank you for listening. And, and that's uh, the, the end, of my, end of my slides. And thank you very much, Hans. Um, let me, I, we have a, a little on a tight schedule. You've got a, a question or two here, but I'm going to try to uh, push through with uh, um, Dr. Mav's course, course garden. Hopefully we'll have time to touch that later on, Hans. That sounds great. Thank you. Um, so the last presentation we have here is, uh, is Dr. Mav's course guard, who's calling him from Denmark. Um, We've had a, a couple of minor uh, technical difficulties, but our, our man behind the uh, curtain, Dan Sinicola, is going to be doing the presentation and uh, Mod speaking. Uh, Mods has been working with uh, research using patch clamping technology for over 20 years. The last seven or so, he's been the global product manager for Sofian's automated patch clamp robot. Uh, he's presenting today on automated patch clamping technology, parallel recording recurrence. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting a better understanding of this Nobel winning process. Uh, Mads, would you like to continue? Starting back to uh, um, Hans, uh, one question we had for you is how does the centering of the droplet or meniscus affect the reading? Okay, great. Um, yeah, so 
an optical sensor. So, so we need to we need to have our sample surface be pretty much perpendicular to the optical axis. So we need to hit the the droplet in the center, if that uh, if, if that makes sense. And and we can find the center because we can take a uh, because we can take an image and from that find the center. If the droplet is really oddly shaped and doesn't really have a center, uh, that's much tougher. Excellent. And and what about dispensed droplets? Uh, dispensed as in dispensed into an, another piece of liquid or dispensed onto a, um, uh, on, onto a surface? Um, the question isn't specific about that. I'm going so, to so get, yeah. we've, we've basically, I mean, we've basically shown both. I mean, the, 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 the droplets, um, uh, I showed um, on on a surface. Th those are those came out of a, out of a liquid handler, out of a nano dispenser type type liquid handler, and the um, uh, I didn't show that, but we have uh, uh, just like we use precision bearing balls to have like a defined droplet. We've done this with droplets added uh, incrementally to to uh, an aliquot already in the well. So we, we can we can do either. Excellent. And uh, and how fast can it do a plate? So so that depends a little bit on um, how deep the plate is. It depends on the density of the plate. Currently, we think that um, 96 well plates um, we can do certainly faster than a minute. Uh, in in many cases, farther far, uh, faster than uh, 45 seconds. And then of course the time goes up as you as you go to to mm -hmm. higher density plates and you gain a little bit because you have to scan less depth. But that's that's sort of a a, a guide. Um, and I think I have some clarification on the, the, the droplet dispers uh, question, um, which is, you know, speaking of dispersed, is in multiple drops, droplets. No, no, I meant dispensed, not dispersed. Excuse me, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so if you, well, if you had, so the, the droplet volume measurement that's shown on a, on a flat surface, we would rely on the, we can only measure one droplet at a time. So Got it. So, I mean, we could conceivably, you could go find several droplets and measure those, but that would uh, blow, blow up the time. All right. Can I advance it or I need to uh, ask you to advance it? I'll advance it. Okay, next slide, please. So, yeah, very briefly, uh, Sofian Bioscience is from a small country called uh, Denmark. You might not know it, it's a kingdom uh, or actually a, a queendom, but you might know the Little Mermaid, uh, the fairy tale writer H.C. Anderson, and the world's largest uh, container carrier, Merskline. And then you might also know that we have uh, Greenland. Next slide, please. So, we are founded in uh, Copenhagen, Denmark, and we also have offices and labs in both uh, Boston and uh, Tokyo. Next slide, please. So we have been uh, instrumental in uh, developing automation of pet clamp technology. This Nobel Prize winning technology that first Hodgkin and Huxley invented or described uh, by means of ion channels back in the in 40 and 50s and later Nea and Sackman invented the pet clamp technology. We turned that into an industrialized product with the first Apache back in 2001. And then we have developed a lot of things with the latest uh, major event being our 384 format APT called Cube, which has also adaptive protocols where you can interrogate every single cell, even though you're recording in parallel, you can interrogate every single cell by means of its own biophysical characteristics. That's a very strong feature to, uh, to tighten up the data spread from biological variation. Next slide, please. So we cover the whole uh, range uh, from basic research all the way to, to drug uh, screening by means of having two instrument lines. The black one is the cube that I'm talking about today and the white one is Cupets 2, which is, uh, which is a uh, similar instrumentation that is uh, slightly more flexible than the cube and has a capacity of 16 or 48 parallel recordings. Next slide, please. So by uh, covering uh, the whole uh, drug discovery cascade from uh, the very beginning, we have the ambition to actually replace the, the otherwise normal secondary screen or confirmatory screen or whatever you like to call it, because normally the first step is done by fluorescence means recording the ion channels. And since that is an indirect measure, for instance, the flipper or other good instruments, because that's an indirect measure of the activity of the ion channel, you will have to use electrophysiology uh, later on to confirm the hits that you found. But starting off with a real electrophysiology, you can omit the secondary screen and thereby 
uh, obtaining the, the leads faster. Next slide, please. We have also, I mean, normally we use cell lines and uh, drug discovery uh, on, on these instruments, but we have also looked into whether they can do more, should we say, sophisticated stuff. And in this case, I'd like to show you the, some data from recording in 384 parallel uh, recordings from uh, uh, induced pluripotent stem cells derived uh, neurological disease models. So next slide, please. Together with brain Excel, we have had the chance to look into these uh, iPSC derived motor neurons. Um, it's a difficult uh, cell type to handle. And actually some of the more uh, challenging step was to actually handling the cells. So uh, covering the step from the incubator onto the instrument because we need to lift off the cells, bring them into suspension, and then the apparatus uh, take on from there on and bring them into the recording plate. But nevertheless, we managed to, in the best recordings, get up to 60% success rate. And success rate here is defined as a membrane resistance better than 200 mega ohms. We, we, we express the tightness of the seal between the cell and the recording uh, substrate in, uh, in uh, ohmic resistance. And 200 mega ohms is, is good. We normally talk about giga seals, but in this case, we set the limit at 200 mega ohms to obtain the recording. And as you can see, we got a uh, inward reflection that is normally carried by a sodium current. And we also got some outward reflections. And we even could record some current clamps from this. Next slide, please. So we dug deeper into this, trying to uh, characterize what it was. Uh, because having a uh, somewhat native cell, so you can have a whole orchestra of ion channels expressed in it. So we uh, made use of uh, various uh, well-defined pharmacological agents. For instance, using tetrodotoxin on the lower left panel to show you that the currents that has this sort of V-shaped uh, characteristics, people in the field will know this as an IV curve. Uh, that IV curve could be totally blocked by adding one micromole of tetrodotoxin, indicating very strongly that there are voltage-gated sodium channels uh, of the, should we say, brain type in this population. Also, the outward current was carried by voltage-gated potassium current, as uh, demonstrated by means of their sensitivity to 30 micromolar TEA and 4 millimolar for amino pyridine. So uh, with these agents, we could say that more or less all of the cells uh, were expressing sodium and uh, potassium currents, respectively 85 and 98%. Next slide, please. We also look into some ligand-gated uh, responses, ligand uh, like uh, gamma amino butyric acid or GABA, to see if we could find any uh, such uh, channels expressed in those cells. And in 45% of the population, we actually saw a response to, to adding GABA. You see here two uh, panels. That's because the instrument can apply the ligand in two different modes, actually more different modes, but here shown as two different modes. We have what we call standard is a somewhat slow application before we start the washout. And in the right hand panel, you can see we can also do the ligand application in a very, very brief, uh, with a very brief exposure of the ligand, namely less than one second exposure of the ligand before we do the washout. That is very useful if you're dealing with uh, desensitizing the ligand gated ion channels because thereby you can omit the desensitization and you can have uh, the cell as its own control because you can stimulate it over and over again. Next slide, please. So we looked into what, uh, what about the uh, expression versus the day in vitro, and we found a sweet spot around about uh, 11 days where we have high success rate and also a decent expression level. Next slide, please. And most interestingly, we had access to a different patient population with one uh, example is the spinal muscular atrophy patients. And we could, on the same instrument, with cells uh, from both controlled, deceased patients, and uh, also deceased uh, uh, cells that had been rescued by means of adding a compound called uh, SMC uh, C3, see that we could rescue this extra uh, expression of uh, voltage-gated sodium channels. That totally uh, aligns with the literature data that you can see in the lower left corner. Next slide, please. Also, another type of uh, disease cells from amyotrophic lateral sclerosis patients, we could see that we could run control cells. We could run cells that carried the uh, ALS 
causing mutation D90A, as well as a uh, rescue, uh, a CRISPR rescue population of those uh, cells from the from patients, uh, uh, bringing them back to the control level in a significant. So we saw that these significant differences in again the expression level of uh, Volsenscape sodium channel. Very very nicely that you can run that on the same instrument having a lot of data because of the 384 format and doing everything else in parallel. Next slide, please. With that, I'd just like to apologize for the delay in getting my voice on, but I hope you got some data out of this, even though it was a pretty speedy version of it. I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Oh, thank you very much, Matt. Um... I think I caught up almost. I have uh, so I have a few questions left over from from Medisense here, but I also, in the interest of uh, sticking to our promise of making this an hour, um, what I'm I'm going to do here, Dan, unless you feel otherwise, is say uh, thank you everybody for attending. Um, we'll take the open questions and we'll forward them to the uh, presenters, um, and hopefully that can create a good dialogue. Um, again, on behalf of, uh, of, of LRIG, uh, thank you very much for attending. You're welcome. And thanks once again to all of the presenters. Ground uh, goes all the way back to the foundings of the lab automation market uh, way back in 1983. So today we're going to be talking a little bit about track-based microplate handling. 